Welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is now our fifth session for the day, uh, 12 o'clock. Um, and uh, I have very great pleasure to introduce uh, the Right Honourable John Glenn, MP. Uh, John um, is has been Economic Secretary to the Treasury and City Minister since uh, January 2018. Uh, he's a Member of Parliament for Salisbury and South Wiltshire uh, and has been so since uh, 2010. Uh, and he was also appointed Minister of State with responsibility for government policy and banking and financial services uh, since last September. So welcome, John. Um, I understand you're going to uh, uh, talk about how um, how the British government um, is is looking at the opportunities that blockchain represents and um, and sort of the, the the pathways through it uh, for the benefit of, uh, of the country. Thank you, John. Great. Well, thanks very much for that introduction and for the opportunity to contribute to today's uh, conference. I don't think I can think of a better slogan than the one that you've chosen this event, expanding the possibilities, exceeding the vision. And I think that applies to what we're trying to do as a government with, in financial services, um, which, as you say, is what I'm responsible and have been for well over four years now. Um, and we obviously also, at the centre of that, is the notion that blockchain and distributed ledger technology, DLT, as you all know, can make a huge contribution to the future of the industry. And that's basically what I want to talk about today. We do see great opportunities as a government uh, in DLT, and we want to pull out all the stops to deliver on those opportunities. I think I'd just go back to the Chancellor's uh, lecture, his May's lecture uh, a few weeks ago, where he set out his ambition for the UK economy to be the most innovative in the world. And that builds on his Mansion House speech in, Jan in July last year, when he specifically named checked the opportunities of distributed ledger technology, as well as fintech, crypto assets, and stable coins, and the potential for a central bank digital currency. Uh, all part of that you know, key plank of the vision of a technologically advanced financial services sector. Now, I think we need to be very excited about this. Um, you all have an important role to play in delivering the vision, um, uh, more so probably than any government minister ever could. We led the way uh, in the UK in the terms of permanent uh, paper banknotes on the first regulated stock exchange, the first ATM, um, and I believe that we can lead the way uh, on this too. And we are a government that wants to pave the way to the future, investing billions more in R&D and bringing the best talent into the UK from all around the world. Uh, and to use the Chancellor's word, words, uh, let's build it and uh, they will come. Uh, and more, let them come and they will build it. So on the specifics of blockchain and DLT as a means of innovation in uh, financial services, let me try and summarize and capture the way we think about them in, in government. So there's clearly a huge potential in DLT and a crucial benefit is that it enables the decentralized sharing and updating of records. And uh, let's talk about that in the context of the financial market infrastructures and the real plumbing that underpins markets. But we are also not being naive about this. We recognize that there are potential challenges which will be vital to navigate in order to do this in the right way. So last year, we ran a call for evidence that asked the industry for their views on the use of DLT in uh, financial markets. And that was part of a wider consultation on crypto assets and stable coins. And the responses that we got emphasized, as you might imagine, the improvements it could be made in DLT if DLT uh, was used to provide the infrastructure services that underpins financial markets. And uh, these highlighted some key views from stakeholders. Firstly, it could make market processes more efficient because if everyone on a distributed ledger network holds the same data updated simultaneously, there'll obviously be less work to do to manage and reconcile that data. The second point was uh, it could bolster resilience, a decentralized system with no single point of failure clearly reduces vulnerability to outages, which can seriously, obviously, disrupt market function. 
Thirdly, it could reduce risk given transactions could settle with greater certainty. And fourthly, it could obviously uh, uh, transpa improve transparency uh, quite significantly. All intermediaries would have to update access to the same data on the distributed ledger network, ensuring greater visibility over what is happening uh, around the network as a whole. There are many other further benefits of DLT that have been suggested. However, the responses affirm the government's view that the realization of these benefits is dependent on the way that DLT is adopted. And one potential scenario is that it's employed in an incremental way alongside existing technologies and only for particular parts of the market. Another is that the markets could be on the verge of a profound shift wherein DLT catches on rapidly and across the market as a whole. And ultimately, this would amount to a fundamental reorganization of financial markets, changing the way existing financial infrastructures operate, as well as uh, leading to the appearance of new players uh, on those markets. Now, both of those scenarios could ultimately come to pass with incremental change in the short term and fundamental change in the longer term. And the government will be taking steps to facilitate the adoption of DLT, but the way in which it will impact market infrastructure is obviously something that the market will decide. But it's also important that we manage those risks of adoption. We should ensure that markets do not become fragmented between DLT and non-DLT systems, or even between DLT systems that don't interoperate uh, with each other. And it's also essential that regulatory outcomes, in particular relating to financial stability and consumer protection, are protected and enhanced. DLT systems must be robust in order to be effective. So I think that's a, a reasonably quick summary of the view uh, we hold around the potential of distributed ledger technology and its adoption and how that would be adoption, adopted across financial markets. But I think there's also a very reasonable question about how we actually get to a place where the potential benefits of DLT can be realised and what the government itself can and should do. Because the truth is that when it comes to DLT, there is still work in progress. But what we do know is that we have to act quickly in order to harness the benefits for the market. Now, the first step is legislation. We've been working closely with the financial services sector to understand how that existing framework needs to be adapted to seize the opportunities that are presenting themselves. And we recognise that existing financial services legislation, specifically the legislation for financial market infrastructure, hasn't been designed with DLT in mind. So we're in the process of working out where changes to legislation should be targeted to ensure they have the, the biggest impact. And we're aware that the only way to reach the right solution is to continue our close cooperation with regulators and industry. And that will require testing and experimentation to ensure that DLT is implemented safely and successfully and government will be involved every step of the way. Uh, I think you know, this is rapidly um, uh, moving, work that's moving forward rapidly and uh, expect uh, the Chancellor will be keen to say some more about this in, in the coming weeks. Um, but it's something that you know, I'm working on closely with him. Now, the Chancellor's already announced that the Treasury will partner with the Financial Conduct Authority and the Bank of England to develop a financial market infrastructure sandbox, uh, which is a safe place for uh, experimentation. And the idea is that this supports firms uh, wanting to use new technologies, in particular DLT, by enabling them to uh, benefit from modifications in legislation where it doesn't currently support the uh, adoption of DLT. For instance, we could enable a trading venue or platform to test the use of DLT in providing market infrastructure services. We intend to put in place a flexible pilot regime, taking advantage uh, of our ability to tailor this to UK markets. And we plan to make good use of that flexibility in allowing sandbox participants to experiment without being subject to every aspect of the legislation that currently applies. 
This will be done while ensuring that regulatory outcomes are safeguarded. And the fact that different jurisdictions are simultaneously driving this forward is evidence of how significant a revolution DLT could potentially bring uh, to the industry. We intend to be at the vanguard of that change. Crypto assets offering new ways to transact and invest are one example of an innovative application of DLT. And our approach so far has focused on managing the most pressing risks associated with crypto assets, but while allowing that market to evolve, ensuring that they're held to high standards of fairness, clarity, and accuracy, and establishing and maintaining robust standards for money laundering and counter-terrorist financing. We also recently consulted on our regulatory approach to ensure that the UK is poised, ready for new forms of private sector digital currency known as stable coins. When it comes to central bank digital currencies or CBDCs, we want to be at the cutting edge of global thinking, which is evolving in different places across different jurisdictions, acting at home on a cross-government basis to understand the risks and opportunities, but leading abroad uh, in fora such as the G7, where the Chancellor has, has been instrumental in, the, in opening up that conversation. So we've committed to consult jointly with the Bank of England on a UK CBDC uh, this year. And last year, the Chancellor announced at FinTech Week the Bank of England's new omnibus account model to enable private sector innovation in wholesale payments. And they allow firms to create innovative wholesale settlement solutions of their own docking into the bank's uh, balance sheet to provide it. And various firms are now exploring how that can be used. So I think the key point here is that the government is ambitious, but we've also got to act uh, responsibly. We want to maintain our position as a world leader in financial technology, creating that regulatory environment in which firms can innovate while keeping the highest regulatory standards so that people can use new technologies uh, reliably and safely. I don't think that's just the right thing to do, it's the sensible thing to do if we're to maintain confidence in the financial system more broadly. But as I said earlier in my remarks, I believe that you have as much a role to play in delivering our vision of DLT and, um, and financial services uh, innovation, if you like, as I or any other government minister does. Um, I know that for many of you, financial services is not the focus of your research, but your efforts are going to make a difference even uh, indirectly. The financial services sector that we're building in this country is more open, more competitive, more sustainable, more technologically advanced. It's going to be an extraordinary asset to the United Kingdom, not just because of the economic contribution that it makes, but as that contributor to tackling some of the great challenges of the day. Now, we're already seeing the power of finance in helping shift that world economy's view uh, of carbon towards net zero. And we've really only just scratched the surface of what's possible and obviously other streams of work on that transition journey that I'm responsible for here in the Treasury. But distributed ledger technology can play its part also. And that's why I wanted to be here today and why I wish you the best of luck with your endeavours. So thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute. And I hope that sets the scene for where we are as a company, where we're aspiring to be. And as I say, I think you can expect more in this space in the, in the weeks ahead. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much, John. That was a, that was a genuine insight. Um, I have a, a, a very quick question for you, if that's OK. Um, <clears throat> we... You mentioned the the uh, the, um, uh, the stakeholders of, of, of last year, where there was a, a consultation, um, and you mentioned um, looking at sort of the, the the possible market impact of adoption, rapid adoption. Have you found an acceleration of acceptance uh, from stakeholders across across the city um, and and the financial services industry um, in the interim? And if that is the case. How is government um, sort of responding to that slight time lag in terms of, of how consultations are put together and then, you know, the industry sort of changing its position a little um, in the interim? 
Well, we have, we have close, ongoing dialogue with industry, and I recognise things do change rapidly all the time as new thinking evolves. What I would say is that you know, there are a series of uh, things that we need to say and we will announce in the coming weeks to, to respond to that. But I'm totally sensitised to this concern around you know, old models of consultation not rapidly moving quickly enough to deal with evolving thinking in the marketplace. And I think it's the same for regulators too. Um, you know, the, 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 they need to have that sort of uh, what's holding to those high standards and those legitimate consumer concerns also be iterative and responsive to what needs to happen. So um, what I would say is, you know, we're not sat here in a single view of how this needs to happen. What we're trying to do is work with industry to, you know, recognise that we're in a competitive situation as well, other jurisdictions, and that's something that I need to grasp as well. Anyway, um, I have to go because I literally have got to... Really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks a Thank you. Thank you, John. Bye. Thank you. Bottom line. Bottom line. No. So fascinating um, discussion with um, with John Glenn MP there, um, and very interesting to see that uh, that the British government is is, uh, is committed to to support what you know certainly in governmental terms and regulatory terms pretty rapid pretty rapid change, um, and I also think it's interesting that. Uh, that he recognised that <clears throat> certainly n not just the financial services industry, but across the board, that the, the speed of change in our space is such that um, that we all have to to uh, to, to really keep on the ball um, and um, and and also be as inclusive as possible. I think there are so many so many competing interests um, um, in the industry, in, in government, and in regulatory authorities, and so on. That uh, you know, just try and try and be as, as inclusive as possible. I and mean, obviously, he's uh, speaking. Um, to the city and uh, the service in, in particular, massive, powerful force. Um, but yeah, so a lot, lot of change for all of us. Hugely exciting, um, as we said right at the beginning of um, of the conference. So uh, I think the time is now for for everyone's work. And um, and yeah, really, really interesting times. Do you have anything to add, uh, Marid or, or, or Nassim? No, I think you have you have summarised it very nicely. Um, I think the problem, uh, the, the challenge for obviously policymakers, regulators, is that things are moving at a very, very fast pace, and you don't want to be left behind. But also, you don't, uh, you want to make you know decisions that are evidence based uh, for your own um, uh, geography, for your own country, but also you, you are, you are very interested in what's happening uh, everywhere else because innovation is moving at a very, very fast pace. Um, much faster than we actually anticipated. I mean, we didn't have much discussion about NFTs even like um, four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, it's uh, there are universities now offering uh, masters and bachelor's degrees in NFTs. So this is this is quite fascinating. Um, so um, yeah, I think with that we, we conclude our session. Marid, any com final comments? We have got. Uh, a short lunch break so we'll we'll be back at one o'clock with uh, professor philip sandner's talk on crypto assets and evidence-based crypto asset policy making yes i think uh, uh, probably many of our audience are from uh, uh, bf from our uh, uh, blockchain association forums uh, most of the members are from european countries and some are out of uh, side of european countries uh, Sometimes they they have uh, they show a bit of frustration in in terms of uh, leg, regulatory uh, lag. But uh, after listening to uh, uh, John Glenn, uh, I think we can clearly understand uh, that even though technology is moving fast, but it is not answering the wider questions which the regulatory authorities are asking. Even they may be answering, let's say, 60% of the questions, but 40% of questions are still answered. Uh, when it comes to regulation, uh, it is a wide, it is a country-wide, even sometime region-wide, even sometime global implication. Uh, so I think we can, uh, after listening to both sides, it might probably take a couple of more years before we start seeing concrete regulation when it comes to DLT and DLT-related 
projects uh, uh, and services. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Um, and again, thank uh, John Glenn MP um, for an uh, excellent sort of discovery of the British government um, approach. We will reconvene uh, for our sixth session, I believe, uh, at 1 p.m. Uh, yeah. So, uh, see you all then. See you. So, Brian, we end the session now, yeah?